Monica says, like, you have to read this, it's so good. She goes, why is this so spicy, God f Hi people, it is Julie Wu and I here today. For the month of August, I have read nothing but sapphic romances. I am a huge book junkie, as I'm sure you can tell by my bookshelf behind me. Actually, somebody asked this on my one of my like reaction videos where I was filming uh, in front of the bookshelf. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple of the books I have here. The Luck series by Jennifer L. Armentrout. I also have her other series, the Covenant series. I love it as well. I have the Bloodline series back here. I have A Court of Thorns and Roses. And I also am obsessed with the Shatter Me series by Tahara Mafi. A couple of series that I love that aren't on the shelf, but I am absolutely obsessed with. Anything by Mariana Zapata. I'm a sucker for that slow burn. Specifically, The Wall of Winnipeg and Me and Dear Aaron. They're spectacular. They're amazing. I'm also really into the Gear Shark series by Cambria Herbert. And those are just to name a few. I have read hundreds upon hundreds of romance books. And so it was really shocking to me when I realized that I actually had never read a sad romance. Sadly, that does kind of make sense to me because to give an example, like even if you go on BookTok, all of the books that are LGBTQ+, that are promoted and go viral on BookTok, are all of gay relationships between two men. A book that I love and adore is Red, White, and Royal Blue. I love this book so much. I actually would love to have a t-shirt that says History Hut huh on it. I'm working on obtaining that. Casey McQuiston actually wrote a sapphic romance, a standalone as well, and very similar branding. Like I'm sure the writing is pretty similar, but it did not do nearly as well as its gay companion. And and I think this speaks overall to the fact that lesbian relationships are seen as more provocative and salacious rather than romantic. So for the month of August, I figured I would rectify that issue and I would read a book like that. I am going to give you guys my thoughts and opinions on the books that I chose. If you look in the description or down on the timestamps, you can see which parts of these videos are spoiler free because I do want you guys to be able to hear my recommendations without getting any spoilers. I hate listening to spoilers before I read a book so there's a spoiler free section for the people who haven't read these books yet and there's a spoiler filled section for the people who have read these books and do want to discuss them and I do want to let you know my like honest opinion and that includes some spoilers. I, I love some of the quotes in these books. I had to share them and I had to talk about them. Without further ado, never have I ever read a sapphic romance. Let's go. The first sapphic romance I read was Tris Six Venom. You can see that I have a lot of my little tabs. I've read other books by Penelope Douglas in the past. I've read Corrupt and Bully. She is not a go-to author of mine, but both of those books I rated very highly. I think I gave them both five stars. She writes very dark, provocative, addictive romances. So I kind of knew what to expect with this book. By the way, if you are going to read this book, I would highly suggest you look at the trigger warnings. They do cover some dark topics. So just a warning if you are going to pick this up. So Tristic's Venom is actually a high school bully romance. It is between Clay the popular girl and Olivia the poor outcast. Olivia is not only ostracized for the fact that she is in a lower socioeconomic status, but also the fact that she is out as a lesbian. Clay, on the other hand, is super in the closet, and I'm not just talking like hiding it from her friends and family, I'm talking hiding it from herself. And I think that that is a big distinction that plays into the story. Clay is obviously very attracted to Olivia, but because she's not out to herself, there's a lot of reaction formation going on in the form of bullying. It actually made the first couple of chapters extremely hard for me to read. I really don't like the idea that it's okay to verbally or physically harm somebody because you're attracted to them. Olivia actually has no idea that Clay is attracted to her. She chalks it up to her being spoiled and homophobic and kind of miserable on the inside, which is isn't that far off 
considering that Clay's home life is extremely difficult, but so is Olivia's, just in two very different ways. One thing that I really loved about this story is that these characters felt amazingly developed as people and not just as a couple. Like one fun fact about Clay is that she's obsessed with Octopus. I just think that's so cute and nerdy and random. But I love that. I feel like that adds a lot of genuineness and truth to the story. Like I've said, I've read a lot of romance books and I feel like a lot of them don't spend the time to develop the characters outside of the relationship. So I really appreciated that about this book. And then seeing the two of them get together as a couple was, it was so amazing. And it was, it was written in such an amazing way. I'm such a sucker for enemies to lovers. Penelope Douglas did such a good job of writing the thought process of each of these characters grappling with what their relationship could be. The angst, oh my God, the angst in this book was top tier. I'm very much into the angst of the relationship before the actual relationship. Like sometimes I like it more than when they actually get together. Clay and Olivia's love for each other was just so consuming and desperate. I really don't know how to fully explain it, but it, this whole book felt like you were teetering on the edge of something the whole time in the best way. I definitely think that the second half of the book where they were more angsty than bullying and fighting made up for the first chunk of the book. So I ended up rating this book, Tres Six Venom, 4.5 stars, um, which to me is like excellent. It's amazing. To explain that rating a little bit more, I'm gonna get into spoiler territory. The reason I didn't give this book a perfect five stars was again, I know it's the trope and I knew going into it what this was, but I just don't like bullying. I, I don't like that trope at all. Penelope Douglas actually writes a lot of bully romances. So like, if it's your thing, that's totally fine. It's just not mine. Reading the scene where Clay writes awful things on Olivia's body in Sharpie, was just horrific for me. It was really hard to read. And then when Clay had the audacity to record Olivia hooking up with their like assistant coach or something and then posting it online, Olivia was like, I can't take it anymore. I'm dropping out of school, which is like warranted if somebody's targeting you constantly. But then Clay was like, wait, wait, where, where are you going? I'm gonna miss you. Like the audacity. But obviously like the bullying turned into angst and tension and then eventually romance. And it was just, it was written so well. I just have to read this one passage for you guys because I think it encapsulates the books, like the book and the story so well. And I just, I just loved it. I have to read it for you guys. At least there's this. I thought hating her was enough. If I couldn't have this, at least I had her attention, even if it was bad. At least I could destroy what I was going to lose anyway in three months when we graduated and I couldn't look at her every day anymore. But God, do I hate her. Her smile and her red lips, the way she smudges her dumb eyeliner, making her eyes look smoky and captivating, and her wild hair that always looks like it flew through the wind before she put it up in a ponytail, her olive skin, how her bracelets make music every time she moves, her chipped black nail polish, and those stupid biker boots with all the buckles she wears that makes her legs so hard not to look at, the way she rolls her skirt up and I can't pay attention in calculus, I hate it all, how every part of her looks like it has a taste. When you read a lot of romance books, a lot of the ways to describe attraction become very redundant. Like, he or she is the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Okay, great, whatever. I released a breath I didn't even know I was holding. Breathing is part of your autonomic system. It's involuntary. You were going to release that breath anyway. I have never read anything quite like this. It was so good that I finished it in one day. I started it August 1st, because that's when I started my challenge, and I ended August 2nd. So it is August? Second. <laughs> I really did not mean for this to be so quick. I thought this would take me a week at least, <laughs> but I just got so invested. This was so good. I'm so glad I started with this. All the purple in here are quotes that I loved. There were a lot of quotes. I can't wait to talk about all of them. I literally went to work those two days too, 
and I still finished it in a day. As I mentioned before, this book is very steamy. Not that like the actions of the two characters were that like insane or bold, but I, like I said, like the writing was just extremely provocative. I loved it. So if you are into steamy romances like I am, this would be a great book for you. As for the ending, I was just so happy. Like the fact that they were living in the lighthouse together that was previously occupied by another like super secret couple. It, that was just so romantic, like that they were looking through the pictures of the previous couple. I just didn't foresee Penelope Douglas including a time jump epilogue, but I was super happy about that. And also the fact that like I'm one of those readers that I don't know if anyone else does this, but I reread the epilogue multiple times, even if it's like only a page long. I find the epilogues to be really sweet and like, well, kind of bittersweet. And I kind of like that feeling. If you guys read this, please let me know your thoughts and opinions or better yet, comment your favorite quotes down below because there are some really good ones. I'm trying book journaling for the first time. And man, I ran out of room. There were so many quotes I loved in this book and so many words that I just wrote down from here because I just, I loved it. The next book I read was Hani and Ishu's Guide to Fake Dating. I am just kind of obsessed with this cover. I think it is so stinking cute. Like just like, look at this. It's so aesthetic and pretty. Normally I don't like people on the cover, but I do like the little caricatures. This is like animated. It's not like a person. I can't wait to put this in my bookshelf. This is a high school romance as well, same as Tristix Venom, but this is far, far more in the YA category. I feel like there are two types of high school books. There's like high school meant for new adult readers, and then there's high school YA meant for actual high school kids. If you're in high school, this might be better for you. Or even like middle school, I feel like this is fine. It's not steamy in any way. It's just a wholesome story. So I think you can tell by the title that this is a fake dating trope, but with a little bit of a twist. Hani, one of the main characters, comes out to her two best friends as bisexual, and they immediately invalidate her sexuality because they're like, well, you've never dated a woman, and therefore I hate them. In the heat of the moment, Hani lies and says, actually, I've been seeing a girl in our class this whole time named Ishu. Now, her two friends actually find that extremely hard to believe because Ishu is extremely antisocial and hyper focused on only academics. Basically, she has a resting bitch face and I've never related to anyone more. And Ishu actually thinks of Hani with disdain in the beginning of the book because she is extremely social in comparison. Not just social in like an amicable sort of way, but in a whitewashing yourself to be more palatable or digestible to your friends. So when Hani approaches her to discuss this like fake dating relationship type of deal. The only reason Ishu says yes is because she actually wants to be head girl, which is a position in their class that's basically determined by popularity. And because she's so antisocial and has no friends, she basically has no chance of winning unless she decides to become friends with Hani's connections. So when they start fake dating, they start, you know, going through social media and having all these planned outings. It really reminded me of the beginning scenes of To All the Boys I Loved Before with Laura Jean Covey and Peter Kavinsky. I just thought that it was like super cute, a little awkward, but still really cute and very wholesome. One thing I really liked about this book is that not only were the two main characters bisexual women, but they were also women of color. I'm not Bengali or Indian like the two main characters are, but I am half Asian and I grew up in a very Asian household. A lot of the sentiments and cultural ideals that were brought up in this book were very familiar to me and they resonated very well with me. One of the funniest things I think happened in the book was when Hani brings Ishu to one of her friend's house and Ishu's like, oh, like, let me just take off my shoes. And she's like, no, 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 she's like, they're white. They don't do that. And I just found that so relatable. Now this is a romance book, but sadly that is where this story fell short for me. I understand that this is young adult. Like just look at the cover. Like it's, it's super wholesome. So I wasn't expecting 
expecting like hardcore steam or whatever. But like I, you can see my bookshelf, like I've read other YA romances that are fade to black, that are just like no steam at all. And I'm fine with that, but they can still accomplish great angst and tension and romance. You don't need smut to do that. But this book really felt just lackluster and kind of blah for me in terms of romance. And considering this trope was fake dating between two bisexual women, I just expected that shit to write itself. Like think of the amount of tension, like the different scenes that you could create between these two women. It could have been so much better. And I think one of the problems was that I think maybe it just needed to be more flushed out because it felt very abrupt. It felt like one second they were kind of like, okay, reluctant allies to, oh my God, I like this girl all of a sudden. And I think what I was expecting was a slow burn, but this book is only 300 pages. You can see how kind of thin it is. Most romances I read are a lot longer than this. So I think it just needed more time to develop. Another thing that really bothered me without giving anything away was the character development was very unfulfilling. One of the characters just didn't live up to my expectations. So for all of those reasons, I only rated this book three stars, which to me means like, meh. It was okay. Now, when I give a low rating, like three out of five, I'm not discouraging you from reading it yourself. Everyone has different tastes. Just because I didn't like a book that much doesn't mean that you won't. Especially this one, because one of the reasons I was hugely disappointed was because it got rated like 4.3 stars on Goodreads. Go give it a shot. I'm just giving you my honest rating and review of the book and what I thought. So to explain my rating a little bit further, now I'm gonna get into spoilers. Like I said, my main issues were the lackluster romance and the unfulfilling character development. And actually those two are kind of heavily tied together. I think it's like one big jumbled up main reason that I didn't like this book. Like there were some cute moments, okay? I'm just gonna read you a little bit. Ishu smiles and my breath hitches at the sight of it. She smiles so rarely that each one the genuine ones that light up her entire being feels like a gift like something private she is only reserved for me that's stinking cute and romantic but i feel like the rest of the story felt more platonic than intended to get very into it tani has two really crappy friends they don't acknowledge that she's bisexual they invalidate her sexuality and not only that they constantly disregard her identity as someone who's Bengali and someone who is Muslim. But my problem is that, okay, her friends are really crappy. For a specific example, her friends do not care that she only eats halal. They just pick a restaurant with no regard to whether she can eat there or not. In comparison, when Ishu and her start fake dating, they want to go on like a planned outing to a restaurant. Hani basically doesn't really think that Ishu can figure out where she can eat. But Ishu is like, duh, I just Googled it. I did my research and they were able to eat together at a restaurant. And I understand what that's supposed to do. That's supposed to signify Ishu is an amazing romantic partner, like she obviously cares for Hani, and she does, I agree, but the action of just regarding your friend's dietary restrictions does not signify to me anything more than consideration and respect. So for example, in my life, I have a lot of dietary restrictions, so do all my friends. My friends will call up restaurants to make sure that I can eat there. Do I think that that means they're attracted to me? No, that's just being a basic, decent human being. And there were a lot of moments like that. Hani couldn't drink and her friends were trying to push her to surround herself with alcohol. She was very uncomfortable. And Ishu was the only one to make sure that she was like, are you okay? Do you wanna leave? Do you wanna do something else? Ishu was basically the only person at that school who treated her like a human being with needs and wants and requirements and who respected her boundaries. Does that mean that I think it's inherently romantic? No, I just wanted this to be more of a romance story because that's what it's supposed to be. They do end up together and they are girlfriends at the end, but it felt very platonic to me. Her friends were so shitty in comparison that Ishu by default seemed like a great romantic partner. But if Hani had good friends, 
there would n be nothing to denote between her great friends and Ishu as a partner. And in the same vein, the unfulfilling character development I attributed was to Hani. Hani, in the end, did not stand up to her friends. I was a little conflicted about this because I understand that sometimes this is how the world works and sometimes people are really crappy, but I don't know, this is a book. Like, I just wish that in the end, Bonnie was like, you guys suck for A, B, C, and D. Like, you did all these things to me. She just kind of like cut them off and never spoke to them again. And I wish that we had gotten that fulfilling resolution of like, I cut you off because you treated me like a terrible person. I just wish that she really just went at them because that would have been really fulfilling to me. You might be thinking like, okay, what about Ishu? Because she also didn't really like stand up to her parents. That was more realistic to me because like she's a minor, she's living with her parents. She can't like cut them off. I think that one of the most fulfilling things was that Ishu developed a great relationship with her sister. And in the end, even though her parents were kind of like pretending like the sister didn't exist anymore, Ishu went to her wedding with Hani and like was able to throw her a party and was able to celebrate that day with her. But that was just my opinion. Once again, just because I didn't like something doesn't mean that you won't like it. I still give this book major props. Once again, this whole the purpose of this whole video is to rectify the fact that I've never read a sapphic romance. Number one, between bisexual women, and number two, between bisexual women of color. Props on this, because I rarely ever see representation like this. I just wish that the story was just a little bit better. The next book I read, and the last book I read in the month of August, Malice by Heather Walter. I only read three books this month, honestly. Normally I could pack down a lot more, but if you do follow me on TikTok, you'd probably know that I went to Florida in the month of August. I was gone for a week, so therefore that cut a huge chunk of my reading time. Now, actually going to Disney put me in a really great mindset because this book is actually a fairy tale retelling. This is between Alice, the Dark Grace, and Aurora, who's a princess. This is if Maleficent and Aurora like fell in love with each other and they had like a gay romance. Malice is actually from Alice's point of view. She is something called a Grace. These are people who are kind of like witches, but they make elixirs or potions that kind of cater to the spoiled and privileged people in their kingdom. If someone wants plastic surgery or a BBL, instead of going to a plastic surgeon, they go to a beauty grace who makes them an elixir and they chug that down. Flip side of that is you can also go to a dark grace. She can make potions that make people look ugly or make people look deformed, but she's highly ostracized in their own society. She doesn't look very pleasant. I think in the book she's described as having like thin hair, leathery skin, like she definitely looks different than everyone else. And on top of that, she is part Villa. Villa is a different race, basically. It's a different type of creature that was known to be evil. So all of her, uh, all the other graces pretty much treat her like crap. What happens is that in their kingdom, they have one line of princesses and queens. Basically, a villa put a curse on all the queens and all the daughters that were to be born after that first queen. Basically, if they don't find true love by the time they're 21, they will die. And it's come to the point where they are at that last chance. They only have one daughter left, which is Princess Aurora. So every single day, she's kissing, like, I think, like, 20, 30, 40 people a day. That kind of annoyed me in and of itself because you can't find true love just by kissing someone. Like I felt, I thought it was supposed to be like, I genuinely feel something for this person. It kind of reminded me of an Akatar, the concept of mates. Like there was nothing that they felt about that person. It just so happened that they were destined to be together. The princess is not as passive as I thought she would be. She is actually searching for a way to break the curse on her own because number one, they're only offering her males to kiss. They live in a heteronormative society and they only want kings and queens to be together. But she kind of knows, she mentions, she's like, 
why aren't they letting me kiss females? Because I'm pretty sure she's like aware that either she's a lesbian or bisexual. Alice, as the Dark Grace, sneaks into the ball that they have for her like 20th birthday, I think it is. She just tries to have a normal time and they actually end up running into each other because Alice is part villa and the curse that was put on Aurora was from a villa. She's like, can you help me and try to break this curse with me? Alice at the same time is receiving training from someone she met named Cal. She realizes that maybe her powers are stronger than she thought. Cal is trying to teach her what exactly she can do. She tries to develop her magical abilities and at the same time she is also trying to help Aurora who she is falling in love with. Without giving any spoilers, I rated this book three stars as well. It didn't go exactly the way I thought it was going to go. I expected this to be a enemies to lovers story. Maleficent and Aurora, like, oh my God, that concept could have been executed so well. Maybe it's just me because I'm such a sucker for enemies to lovers, but I expected this story to give me more than it did. And instead you got friends to lovers in a very abrupt and not slow burn kind of way. Um, I also didn't like the character development in this story. I also should probably mention that this is a duology. So there's a second book that is coming out. So I kind of knew when I was reading this, I was like, there's obviously going to be a cliffhanger because there is a second book. I didn't like the ending. I didn't. So for all those reasons, I rated this three stars as well, which as I told you before means meh. It's okay. But once again, um, I'm going to say that I'm not discouraging you from reading it. It just was not my cup of tea. I just expected more from it. Um, and so to explain that a little bit more, I'm going to go into spoilers. Here's what I expected, right? Like my alternate story to this would have been that the Dark Grace hated this kingdom, right? Like she already did. In this story, Alice does hate this kingdom. She resents it, but she doesn't have the power to like challenge the kingdom in any way. She's slowly learning. And I think that was one of the problems with this story. When I watched Maleficent and I love Disney's version of Maleficent. I love that movie so much. She knew the extent of her power. She like developed it and she was very strong. I wish they had started off that way. I wish that she had already been trained in her magical abilities and so she was messing with the kingdom and she was kind of like already a villain, right? I wish they had been more at odds and she wasn't like a victim subjected to this kingdom's rule. Because at the time she's still weak and she's still learning and she is not super angry yet She's just kind of reserved and I think broken. What I wished would happen was that she hated this kingdom so much that she cursed Aurora herself. And that she, just like in Maleficent, I wish she had cursed Aurora herself. If you wanna add the stuff about the villa and the other kingdoms, there was a lot of high fantasy conflict and war and like politics. If you wanna add that, fine, but it, because this is a romance and they framed it as a romance and not just a character retelling, I wish she had cursed Aurora. I wish she hated her. I wish she hated her vehemently from the beginning. And I wish something happened that made them come close in proximity and then she regretted the spell that she put on her. I wish that that would have happened. I wished it was like hardcore enemies to lovers. Instead, in this book, it was kind of simpy. She was kind of simp. Immediately when she meets Aurora, she's like, oh my God, she's so beautiful and so nice and sweet. There's a time and place for simping, like somewhere down the road that would have been nice. Not right off the bat, like girl, keep it together. Like suck the emotion back in, please. You just met this girl. Even when they like get together, it's kind of unfulfilling. I think they needed it to be more drawn out because when they got together, it was like, that's nice, I guess. On top of that, a lot of the things that happened in this book were also just sad. I felt for no reason. Alice has zero allies. She has zero people in her corner. Every person who she thought was her friend was not her friend, which I felt was just 
unnecessarily sad. If all of that had happened, like I said, before this as a prologue, like if she had lost everyone she cared about before this book even came out and it, this story was after she had been rejected and beaten and hurt and like that would have been great for me but to read this story and get to the end and realize that everyone that she had trusted didn't care about her that sucked okay that really sucked and then at the end aurora is put in a sleeping curse so she literally has no one it made for a really really depressing sad ending and i know that there's another book i don't know if i'm gonna read it i don't know if i care that much honestly about what's gonna happen to these people now i'm sorry to end this video on a sad note again i'm not saying you shouldn't read these i'm just giving you my honest opinions i was supposed to read two more books this month once again next on my list i'm really sad that i didn't get to read this but was one last stop by Casey McQuiston. I'm really excited for this one. The next book that I'm reading is The Priory of the Orange Tree. Look at this thick sucker. If you want to know my opinions on these two books, because I am really sad that I didn't get to squeeze them into August, please go follow my TikTok. I promise I will do a review on both of them when I'm done. I've been making a lot of book talks and I'm having a lot of fun with it, to be honest. So follow my TikTok. It'll be linked in the description. Or if you want to look it up yourself, it's the Julie with an eye. I really like these reading challenges. So if there's any big series, I swear you guys, I know you want me to read the Harry Potter series. And I'm also thinking about reading the Twilight series because I've never read that in my life, but I have watched the movies. So if there's any other series or any other big like books or book franchises that you want me to delve into, let me know in the comments. I love you guys. Have a good one. Bye. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. My friend, I sent her the link to this book, to Tristix Venom, because I was like, you have to read this, it's so good. She goes, why is this so spicy? God, f <laughs> Okay, but I'm also judging her theater, really. This is too distracting. This was a bad time to start this book. Oh my, OMFG. It's too hot. What the F? I was really judging this book description on the website, but it's going really well. Yeah, bro, I don't, I don't play around. <laughs>